do something that good speakers shouldn't do, and that is I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and let you know what I'm thinking. Um, as an attorney, and Bobby, thank you for mentioning that I do cases for free. Don't tell people that. <laughs> um, um, as an attorney, and probably the same thing is true for you as a physician, I got to stay detached. I can't get emotionally engaged in the case. If I get emotionally engaged in the case, I stop thinking, right? I let my emotions take over. I got to stay cool and detached. Client's emotional, I got to stay distant. I'm not emotionally distant about the message I'm bringing this morning. I'm a little passionate about it. And so um, I invite you to pray with me and for me that God will speak through me and it won't be me, it'll be him. So, Father, thank you for this opportunity. I ask that you will send your spirit here, that you will fill this space. And that like your friend Job, I will speak of you what is right. Thank you in Jesus' name. All right. So I'm going to talk about the shocking beauty of what Jesus didn't say. This is a message about Jesus' reading of the Torah in his hometown synagogue of Nazareth. What he didn't say made them angry. What he said made them angry enough to pitch him off a cliff. As I get ready to give this message, I rejoice in the fact that there are no cliffs in Virginia Beach and that I could probably survive being rolled down Mount Trashmore. <laughs> Before I get into what's going on in the synagogue that day in, in, in Nazareth, I have to talk about a little bit of history to help you understand the context. Because you understand that when we read the Bible, we are reading stories about a culture that's very different than ours. The people acting in these stories didn't necessarily think like, like, like we think. They had different assumptions. Their culture was different. And the cultural context in Nazareth is key to understanding what went on that day. So, the nation of Israel, 12 tribes come out of Egypt, 12 tribes conquer Canaan. They were united under the rule of King Saul, King David, King Solomon. And then in the reign of Solomon's heir, Rehoboam, the country split into two kingdoms. There was the country of Israel in the north. I know this is a little confusing because they're all Israelites. But the northern kingdom of ten tribes was called Israel. The southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin was called Judah. Everybody with me? Okay. So... Neither kingdom lasted really very long. Judah lasted longer. The northern kingdom of Israel fell fairly quickly to the Assyrians. A series of Assyrian invasions wiped them out. Their own idolatry and terrible behavior led God to step back and let them go. And predictable consequences followed. But the Assyrians came in and exiled a good bit of the population. Sometimes you hear about the lost tribes of Israel. That's what they're talking about when, uh, when they say that. Um, other people came in and settled. Pagans kind of came in and took over. To the extent there were people who were biological Israelites there, their worship had kind of metastasized, devolved into something that wasn't real Judaism. They didn't want to go to the temple in Jerusalem, for, for example. They built their own. And so by the first century, these people are called Samaritans. You've heard of the Samaritans, right? And Jews and Samaritans did not get along. Now, I'm sorry, that's a small map. It's the best I could do. You'll see the Sea of Galilee, if you can see it, is in what was the country of Israel. And Jesus was from this area. This is his hometown. He's from Nazareth. And there are a bunch of names you recognize. Capernaum, Gennazareth, Magdala, Mary Magdalene, Cana, Nazareth, Bethsaida, all there around the Sea of Galilee. These communities were colonies. 
Jesus came from a very conservative religious community. Most of these communities would have been conservative Jewish communities. They thought of themselves as colonists, as settlers who had come into this area that God's people once had, and they were going to reclaim it for God. Does that make sense? So they were very devout. They were very intense. They were very conservative in their Judaism. These people took God and their faith seriously. In fact, the very name Nazareth comes from one of two sources. It could come from the word Nazar, which means to, to watch, and Nazareth, if, you'll, if you see, it's up on high ground, like a lookout. So it could have come from that word. I think it probably came from netzer, which means branch. And we see this word in, for example, Isaiah 11.1. Isaiah a shoot will spring from, uh, from the stem of Jesse, and a branch, netzer, from his roots will, uh, will bear fruit. It is a messianic prophecy, but that's how they saw themselves. We, we are a little community. We're not a tree. We're a little branch. But something's going to grow from what we're doing. Something great's going to grow f from it for God. Are, are you with me? So in their very name is their sense of identity. All right. A little bit about first century synagogue protocol. The chief seats in the synagogue, the front rows here in this context, would be for people of prominence or promise. A Torah reading was predetermined. They had a calendar. And either somebody from one of these front row seats or if there was a prominent guest would be invited to read that day's passage. They would take the Torah out of a case they called the Ark and hand it to him. He would stand at a, at a podium and he would read the passage and then he would talk about it. And then a general discussion would follow. They had a seat for this person or for the synagogue leader called the seat of Moses. And here actually is what's left of the synagogue in Chorazin around the Sea of Galilee. And there you'll see Moses' seat. And there is the platform that the, uh, that the reader would, uh, uh, would have read from. And there by the door is the ark the Torah would have been contained in. And here is an actual, an actual recreation of the synagogue in Nazareth that Jesus spoke at. So, everybody with me? We good? So that's the context this story takes place in. Luke chapter 4. And Jesus returned to Galilee from the, from the temptation in the wilderness, in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread, spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the scroll and found the place where it was written, and then he read today's scripture. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim a release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down in Moses' seat, and Luke writes that the eyes of everybody in the synagogue were fixed in English on him. The Greek word is a tenazonte. That means they are staring or glaring at him. What did he do? And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What did he do that made them a tenizante? What did he do that made them glare at him? Well, the passage he was reading from was Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, uh, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I'm sorry, a freedom to the prisoners, and then to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. They weren't expecting him to stop. He didn't finish it. Because the next line reads, and the day of vengeance of our God. Who do they want vengeance on? Everybody around them. They want vengeance on the Samaritans. They want vengeance on the Romans. You didn't, you didn't get to the good part. But wait, there's more he didn't read to comfort all those who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion. Now, what does Zion mean? It's a word for a city. Jerusalem. Who lives in Jerusalem? Jews. So they want him to say, I'm coming to comfort you to give the the Jews a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they, the people in Nazareth, will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting. Do you see that word? Netzer. That's us. That's what we are. And you didn't read it. Then they, the people in Nazareth, will rebuild the ancient ruins. Then they will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of of, of many generations. This kingdom that was split, Israel, gone, Judah, under the thumb of Rome. It's going to be restored. Our cities are going to be restored. This thing that we're doing here that we've worked so hard on, our vision, you're just ignoring it. Ah, this is the best part. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks. Anybody ever worked around sheep? They're stupid and they stink. It's a nasty job. We're not going to have to do that anymore because when the Messiah comes, foreigners are going to come in and do this nasty stuff for us. Foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. No more hauling manure for us. The pagans will do it. But you will be called the priest of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of God. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. He was supposed to read that, and he did not read a word of it. He just closed the scroll and sat down. And they're glaring at him. Why did you stop? Then this. Now, I got to get a little grammatical here. I apologize if English or grammar language is not your thing. Again, this is written in Greek. Greek has lots of different tenses. Verse 22 reads, All were speaking well of him. Actually, the Greek is... uh, a martyrun, and it means all were bearing witness to him literally. Now, it's in the dative tense, and dative in Greek can be a dative of disadvantage, like it's, pos- uh, like it's negative, or a dative of advantage, like it's positive. Do you think, based on their reaction so far, that it's negative or positive? It is negative. They're not speaking well of him. They're grumbling. They're talking about him. It says they were wondering at the gracious, and the Greek that's translated gracious is logos keratos. And keratos is where we get the word charity. It's the word that's translated love in part of 1 Corinthians 13. He's talking about all this nice stuff. We don't want to hear about nice stuff. We want vengeance. We are God's chosen, dare I say, his remnant. And we want everybody to recognize that. 
We want our day because we've been under everybody's thumb and everybody's heel for long enough. And they began to say, is this not Joseph's son? Now, I am from a small town in Tennessee. In fact, I'm from Collegedale. You guys know Collegedale, right? Adventist, ghetto, uh, uh, the holy city. After I moved to Virginia, sometimes people would come up and touch the hem of my garment and be healed because I had lived in college there. <laughs> when I was in high school at Collegedale Academy, if somebody in that community got pregnant who wasn't married, everybody knew. These people may not have all been literate, but they could count. They could count months. And they could figure out that from the date of Mary and Joseph's wedding to the date of Jesus' birth was, did not equal nine. He's Joseph's son, the carpenter. This message, and, and guys, what he said was beautiful. What he read to them from Isaiah 61 was absolutely beautiful beautiful. Freedom for the captives, sight to the blind, relieve the burdens of the oppressed, and they didn't care. In fact, limiting, <laughs> limiting the message to hope and peace and grace made them angry. And he doubles down. He said to them, no doubt you will quote this, this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. No. Truly I say, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Now look at what he does next. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the pagan land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And you know the story, right? You know the story, how Elijah approached her said, give me something to eat. She said, well, I only have this little bit of flour and this little bit of oil, and I'm going to make one last meal for my son and I, and then we're going to die. And Elijah said, give it to me. And she did it. And God never let that jar of flour or oil run out for the famine. But then this happened later. Her son got sick and died. And look at what she says. She said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to bring my iniquity to remembrance. There was something in her past that was burdening her. So not only is she pagan, she's not even good. She's not even a good pagan. She's got a bad background. And Jesus tells them, Elijah didn't get sent to people like you. He got sent to people like her. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And Naaman was not exactly a cooperative patient. I think the story's kind of funny. Naaman shows up with this big retinue and all this gold and silver and stuff to pay the prophet for, for performing the miracle. And the text literally says they came up to the house. They had this kind of mental vision of, you know, Naaman's guy going on this little small building, all these guys behind him. And the servant, not even Elisha, but the servant comes out and says, Go wash the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. And closes the door. And Naaman's ticked. He's offended. But Naaman was furious. 
and went away and said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot, a kind of a Harry Potter, a Bodicadab, or whatever, and cure his and cure the leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? I could have washed in them. And so he turned and went away in a rage. He's a pagan, he's not even a nice pagan. He's not humble, but he does it. And the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. Is it possible? Is it possible that somebody in a synagogue, dare I say somebody in a church, could be so wrapped up in their own conception of God and think they know exactly what he's like and what he wants, that when God himself comes and tells them they're wrong, they, re they reject it? Is that possible? They drove him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built. That's ironic, right? If they did get their name from that Zare, watchman, lookout, built the city up on, up on high ground to be a lookout for God, and now they are trying to pitch God off the mountain. But passing through their midst, he went his way. This is where I get, this is where I feel my passion. So, I said I'm from Collegedale. The vast majority of people I went to high school with are no longer Seventh-day Adventists. The city of Collegedale is ringed with tens of thousands of former Seventh-day Adventists. It's funny. When Jesus was here, sinners were pulled to him. We did something that pushed these people away. And I contend it is because we've been, we've been putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. We think... A sister said something earlier that I agree with. She said, when people reject the truth, if it's exposed to them, that's a problem for them, and I agree with that. But the truth that God is trying to expose them to is himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is Jesus. That's the truth. And if we had been holding up Jesus as we ought to, and not the rules. I'll talk about the rules in a second. Collegedale would not be surrounded by thousands of former Adventists. Now, I believe that God gave us the rules. God gave us the rules to keep us safe. The rules are there to protect us. But keeping the rules is not the goal. I will say it again. Keeping the rules is not the goal. It is, an, it is a means to the goal. That's like saying the goal of, of an offense in football is to block and run and catch. Well, yes, but, the, but they're trying to score a touchdown. You block and catch and run to score a touchdown. This is the goal. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. And I wonder, friends, how many people in the Christian community, in the Seventh-day Adventist community, have, have theological knowledge. And by the way, those people Jesus was talking to, the men would have had the Old Testament memorized. Memorized. 
Nobody knew more theology at the time Jesus was alive than the men who went into Pilate and said, break his legs so he'll die more quickly because we can't have him on the cross on the Sabbath. Too many of us still have our old selves. But we baptize them. We put church clothes on them. People talk about worldliness. We can't have a worldliness in the church. Like worldliness is mostly a function of what you wear or what you eat. It's not. Worldliness is a condition of the heart. Jesus said, what goes into a man does not make him unclean. What comes out of his heart is what demonstrates his uncleanliness. The goal, verse 23, is to be made what? Be made new in the attitude of your minds, to have a fundamental change, to put on the true self created to be like who? Like God. That's the goal. That's the end zone. That's what God is trying to do. And it burns my heart that we have set up another goal. It burns my heart that we've created this vision of God where God is mostly concerned about what you believe theologically. Look, I believe theology is important, but theology is important because false theology paints a false picture of God and makes it harder for people to trust Him. Does that make sense? That's the only reason it's important, period. Period. When I was at Regent University, law school was a three-year program. My first year was tough. I was going through a lot. And there were people in that community, Pentecostal people. They prayed for me. I remember one time they prayed for me. They're probably never going to see this. Their names were Fred and Renee Ross. And they put their hands on me and prayed for me. And they started speaking in tongues. Felt a little uncomfortable. But I'll tell you this. Their love for God, their love for other people, their impact on that community was so beautiful that I would have felt like an idiot to try to convince them on the state of the dead. You got what I'm saying? Because they're in the end zone. They're already in the end zone. Does that make sense? Now I want to tell you about something that's worse than just focusing on the rules as if they're an end in themselves. What's more damaging than that? And that's making up our own rules. In Deuteronomy 4, God told Moses, whatever I command these people to do, do it, but don't do what? Don't add to it. I don't want to get in trouble. Then again, no cliffs, only a gently sloping hill. So I'm just going to go for it. Look, my wife's family is Colombian. I've been to her... <laughs> Elena just gave me a little careful. Uh, um, they do church differently. They got ladies with white gloves, and if you talk or something, they'll come over and... You know, like a nun in a Catholic school, right? Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's not scripturally required. You got me? RGF does worship different than you guys, but what we do is not scripturally required. And what you do here is not scripturally required. You got that? If you brought Peter in here and showed him this worship service, he would not recognize it. They didn't do anything like this in the first century church, and that's okay. Don't make a rule out of something that God says is not a rule. 
Don't. Don't. And here's why, here's why God told them not to do that. Because communities that do that are not safe places for God to bring people. We bring people in and say, well, we're a Bible-believing church, but that's not true if we impose rules that don't exist in the Bible. And don't try to cobble together 80 or 90 verses to prove something. In the Bible, the main things are the plain things. Look, I enjoyed the worship service this morning. I'm not trying to get you all to change it. But don't feel like the way you do things is the way that God ordains it because it's not any more than RGF. Your worship should be a spontaneous expression of who God is. Sometimes that's going to be kneeling. i got to be careful here. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> David danced. Now, someone may say, well, that wasn't in the church. It wasn't in the temple. That's true. It's true. But you know what the temple symbolizes? The body of Christ corporately and you individually. You are the temple. Now, I don't want to get in trouble. Oh, God, well, I'm just going to say it. I don't care. So... This building, it's not holy. It's not. What makes something holy? God being in it. If the Holy Spirit is in me, that means that that's holy ground. And if I move down here, guess what? This now becomes holy ground. It is the presence of God that makes something holy. Jesus, speaking of their temple, said, Behold, your house is left to you desolate, because I'm not welcome there. And there are too many churches in the Adventist church where God, the Jesus who came in and preached this message in Nazareth, would not be welcome. I was one time in a church. They made a rule that you couldn't raise your hands in praise because the Pentecostals do that. I wanted to say, trust me, nobody will ever confuse this church for being a Pentecostal church. It's not... <laughs> And then there were more rules that followed. We can't do this because they do it, and we can't do this because it leads to that, and we can't have that color in the carpet, and we got to keep pew, and, and we got to be careful about this and this because of this color and that color and this symbolism. And there was a woman who wanted to get baptized, and she'd been going to the church for years, and she loved everybody, and everybody loved her, but she had a ring from her mother, her dead mother, and she didn't want to take that ring off. And some of the members went to the pastor and said, we can't do that because the ring's got satanic occult significance. And the pastor buckled. So no baptism. Forgive my passion. What God does with communities who adopt that attitude is He goes through them. And He moves on. Here's the reality, friends. <laughs> my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I underlined yours because he's not talking about us generically, collectively. I mean, he is, but he's talking about me and he's talking about you and you and you and you and you. And who are we to say that I know the mind of God on something that he has not clearly revealed? So if you're tempted to do that, stop it. And if you've got somebody in a church who is doing that, I'm calling on the rest of you in God's name to tell them to stop it. Because what that will do is it will make this community not a safe place. God will not bring people in here. If they're members running around, making stuff up, putting rules in place that are not in God's word. You cannot have that. Well, you can. You can have it. You can do it. Ain't going to grow. Not going to... Guys, I don't know if you noticed this. May not be aware. It's getting crazy out there. It's getting crazy. The cultural structures that made this in some respects a Christian country are collapsing or have collapsed. All the institutions that drive this culture, the media, the, the, the government, entertainment industry, music, film, education, all of these things are aligning themselves or have aligned themselves against God. You do recognize that, right? Don't you think it's time to stop fighting about the color of the carpet? Don't you think we shouldn't be making rules about someone raising their hands? I, I've, I said my wife's family's Colombian. I love my wife. She's a little crazy sometimes. Um, <laughs> she will... They know her. Uh, some, of, some of you know her. Um, I, I have felt very uncomfortable with things in the church context. And my wife traditionally has been a lot more, just let it happen and let's see, let's see if God's in it or not in it. And usually she's been right. Usually she's been right. We're all wired differently. Some of us feel more comfortable. Some of us have uh, what, what Jordan Peterson would call a high openness trait. We're very open to new things. Others are less so. That's okay. But don't baptize your openness, because we shouldn't be open to everything, right? Some things are not good. But don't baptize your conservativeness and say, well, this is God's will. No, no, no. God's different than us. And so I invite you to come on a journey with me. It's a little scary. It's a little scary. But it's good. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, Jesus said, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. In theory, the Holy Spirit leads the nominating committee. That's, that's the theory. <laughs> and that's always been the way it is, right? Wrong. No. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if the Holy Spirit did actually lead the nominating committee? Wouldn't it be kind of cool if your connection with God was so close that you were actually led throughout the day? Where you were in constant communication with God and God could say, hey, I know this isn't on the agenda, but go there. Because there's somebody you don't know about who needs you. 
Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Friends, we, we could be so much more than what we are. God does not want anything to have dominion over you. He doesn't want anxiety. He doesn't want fear. He doesn't want a sense of... I used to go... Um, these True Wind Leadership Summits. They're put on by two guys from Blue Mountain Academy. Really good. It was for teens, college kids. And this is, this is at Adventist institutions, right? And Dave Ferguson and Sergio Menente, the guys who led it, had a real, had a real ear and eye for art, which... Adventist Church historically has not done great with art unless you do classical music. It's not something we do particularly well. I don't know. I guess we think paintings are Catholic or something. I don't know, but whatever. Dave Dave and Serge had a really good eye for it, and they would do a prayer tent. Big army canvas tent from like the Korean War, War era. And they would decorate it beautifully, and they had papers on the walls with markers and crayons for these kids to write what was on their heart. And I wish you could have read what those kids wrote. How empty these kids were feeling. How how much pain they had. And I thought, these are our kids. Why have we not given them Jesus? We say that God can do all these things. Well, let let him do it. Get out of the way. Listen to him. Go where he's telling you to go. Do what he's telling you to do. And be open for him to surprise you. Because he will. I guarantee you, everybody who's hearing me right, right now has something in your life that God wants to change, desperately maybe wants to change, that you don't know about. And that holds true, uh, true for me. So will you be open to that? Comfort is the enemy of growth. Too many of us are comfortable. The thing that you need the most is in the place you don't want to go. Let God take you there. Let him take you there individually and let him take you there as a community. That's my prayer for you.